if governments and central banks were responsible and did not debase their currencies as much as they do, Bitcoin would still end up taking over. It would just be a slower process, but it'd be one that would be less painful for normal people. Mm. I'm very worried that the debasement of fiat currency is going to cause a bond market collapse and is going to lead to a catastrophic economic depression. And Bitcoin and crypto will absolutely help people get out of that. It'll help people avoid it, escape it, rebuild the world after it. But it's going to be a very harmful and, and horrible phenomenon for the world to go through. Every president in the U.S. prints more money and spends more money than the president before him. This is true for Biden. This was true for Trump. It was true for Obama. It was true for Bush. That's just going to perpetuate until the dollar collapses. So there's nothing really new about Biden in that sense, but he certainly is not wasting any time in announcing that he will just be spending as much as possible, as fast as possible. So the, the curve definitely seems to be accelerating. Fundamentally, to the extent that Bitcoin challenges the dollar, it is going to be seen as a, a threat to national security. And it shouldn't, it should be seen as the salvation for national security. It should be seen as the way that Americans can actually prevent their wealth from being destroyed by debasement. You know, like what is more American than like making sure Americans are okay and safe and not just not ruined. Bitcoin, I think is very pro-human, but it is going to be viewed by politicians as treasonous, as, you know, anti-government, anti-country when it's, when it's really not that those things. So as Bitcoin grows and as fiat currencies and the banking system falter, and have problems, especially whenever we get into the next big financial crisis. I think Bitcoin is going to be vilified by whichever party or politician is in office. And that's going to be a, a huge challenge and a huge trial that the industry is going to have to go through. Swissborg is sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the markets. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Eric Voury, CEO and founder of Shapeshift, one of the OGs in the crypto space. Eric, it's such a pleasure to have you. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Crypto Slate. If you guys want a summarized version of this interview, then please check it out. We'll have all the gems that Eric's going to share today. We're going to talk about Bitcoin, of course, and its evolution. So without further ado, Eric, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm very well. Thanks for having me on. And if you guys have never heard of Eric Vouris, you have been missing out. One of the most knowledgeable people when it comes to Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency space. Tons of cool interviews, talks, presentations, debates. Check him out. He is amazing. And when I have very knowledgeable people, there's one thing that I always like to start with, Eric, is a simple, easy question. Why Bitcoin? Why did you fall in love with this movement? That's kind of the most interesting and important question is like, why, why do we do this stuff? Um, for me, I had, I had become very, I don't know, depressed with the fact that, uh, that money itself was controlled by governments. And to me, that seemed like the, the biggest problem in any market economy is if the most important good, which is money is centrally planned and controlled by by the government. You know, people generally understand that in a market economy, you don't want a central government, you know, commanding and controlling uh, the good, the goods that are in it, right? Um, people like to think of the Soviet Union and how, you know, under communism, the goods in the economy were planned by the government. And yet in the, you know, most free market economies of the world, um, we live under monies that are controlled 
in that way. So that always bothered me and I didn't have a, a really good answer or how, like how that would be solved. And then when I learned about Bitcoin, um, you know, this was back in 2011, it to me immediately stood out as a potential solution that this could actually be what, what happens that people just start using this open source digital money. Uh, and, and here we are almost a decade later and it's growing and growing and, and kind of coming to pass. That's amazing, Eric. And so was it this decentralized nature that made it more preferable or, or a better choice than all the other attempts that were, that were trying, to be, trying to be successful prior to Bitcoin? Prior to Bitcoin, money for throughout human history was typically precious metals, specifically gold. And uh, gold is great money, but it doesn't work very well for normal transactions. It's very cumbersome and burdensome. And um, so the, the only way you can have gold work in modern society with transactions is to digitize it, which means you have a vault somewhere with gold deposits and then you have digital gold uh, receipts and those receipts can trade around like, like money. Uh, and there was actually a company that tried this called eGold back in the 90s or early 2000s. They started getting some decent traction and then uh, governments shut them down. And the issue there was, of course, the centralization. If you have to trust that an entity will redeem your money for, for real gold, or you have to trust that that entity will continue um, thriving and, and perpetuating, the money system is, is doomed. You, you can't have a money system that is reliant on any person or any any company. So um, eGold got got destroyed. And, you know, when Bitcoin came out, it was that decentralized aspect, the fact that it was immutable, could not be shut down, had no borders, had no entity, had no central servers. These things made it something substantially different than anything that had existed before. That makes a lot of sense. And it's so beautifully, so elegantly put, Eric. And, you know, when you talk about gold, I can't stop to think about your amazing debate with Peter Schiff back in the day. And obviously, many people have debated him since, by the way. For those who haven't seen that video, we'll put the link below. It's a great, great debate on gold versus Bitcoin. And uh, you were arguing in favor of Bitcoin replacing government fiat. And uh, it was a really, really exciting debate, you know, pros and cons on both sides, a little bit of humor as well. But um, if you had to talk to Peter again, like as of today, would have anything have changed in, in this debate? Are there any other things or advantages that you see uh, on Bitcoin versus gold or, or vice versa? Yeah, well, actually, I've had two debates with Peter. One was 20, like early 2014 or late 2013. Um, and then the other one was 2018, which I think is what you're referring to. Fiat works pretty well, right? It's got pyramids and government buildings printed on it, so you know it's valuable. <laughs> also, it is backed by paper. Paper can be burned if you're cold in the winter. There's its intrinsic value. Try that with gold. <laughs> People who transact in dollars or euros or n have complete confidence in their value. They may acknowledge that they will lose value slowly, but they accept that. The, the latter one was actually supposed to be Bitcoin versus fiat, you know, like which is which is better, Bitcoin versus fiat. And he took the position of of fiat going into that debate. But then, of course, all he did was defend gold the whole time. Um, I've been very saddened by Peter's course in life because, <laughs> uh, you know, you're you're doing this video from Dubai. I when I lived in Dubai, one of the things I listened to in the car every day when I went to work was Peter Schiff's podcast. And this was in the midst of the financial crisis. Um, I listened to his podcast and it's from him that I learned a lot about what money is, how it works, how it should work, how it's been corrupted by central banks and, and why that is such a problem. Um, and I learned a lot of that from him. Years later, I discovered Bitcoin and then years later, I get to have a, a debate with him because he was, you know, so, so anti Bitcoin. And uh, it's just been really sad that his, his affection for gold itself has blinded him to an even better form of free market money. And I'm, I'm absolutely a fan and advocate of gold. I think it's great money. I think it's vastly superior to fiat. And I own some, uh, I, I probably always will. But Peter just ha has not been able to realize that something even better has come along. And he can't get over the fact that it's not physical, which is so funny because he spends all day debating with people over digital mediums, you know, like, he, his life, as most of our lives, are digital lives. And to, yeah. to think that something can't have value just because it's digital uh, is, is pretty preposterous. So, yeah, it's been sad to see him go down this path. Um, he's too far gone at this point. Like, there's, there's zero chance that he sees the light. Um, and so 
he'll just have to live with that record. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. And, you know, uh, you've actually paid lots of respect in the debate, which is really cool. If, for all you guys out there, you definitely should watch this debate. But I'd love to ask you another really simple question, actually. But it's even being in this space for, you know, since 2016, I still struggle to answer this question. You know, what is Bitcoin? What is the right definition? Is it gold 2.0? Is it the intersection of gold and, and electronic cash? Is it the ultimate store of value? Like, have you managed to find a definition or is it still too complicated at this point? I think the problem with trying to define it is that it is it is something new. Mm. Like it, it, there, there isn't a perfect analogy because it's something totally new that humanity has never had before. So at best, you can make uh, analogies that are always imperfect. Um, back when I was first learning about it and trying to teach other people about it, I would define it sort of as two things: a payment system, which is the the blockchain network, the peer to peer network on which. Bitcoin's currency moves around and then the Bitcoin units, right? So it's these two things. The Bitcoin units are the form of money. There's 21 million of them that will ever exist. And then there's the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a payment network that can't get shut down. And these things share the same name. Um, and I think that's part of what confuses people because Bitcoin is more than just one thing. It's several parts that make up a, a whole. Um, now, is it like a store of value? You can't design something to be a store of value. I think that's something that becomes earned. Mm. Um, Bitcoin is absolutely earning that title, but it still has a long way to go to earn it over many decades. Um, gold has absolutely earned that title and took thousands of years. You know, with Bitcoin, it might take 10 or 20 or 30, but it's definitely earning that. And um, even though it's not in its current form a convenient currency for small purchases, it's a great currency for big purchases. If you're trying to uh, if you're trying to send a thousand dollars across the border, you know Bitcoin is by far the the most superior way to do that. So um, yeah, I mean people find different uses for it. It doesn't have to be the same thing for all people, but ultimately what it is is a new form of money and a payment system that cannot be turned off. You know, there's something that you mentioned the other day, and I guess non-custodial wallets is kind of something that's quite big these days. And I always wanted to ask you this question, Eric, because, you know, controlling our wealth to me sounds more like the government doesn't control it, doesn't necessarily mean that I can hold it on a ledger. Uh, to be honest, I'm a very a clumsy person and I'm always scared of, you know, losing a, my private key or if I die or something, is my family going to be able to make use of the private key? And actually, to be very honest, I prefer having the majority of my wealth through custody a third party custody provider that I can trust yeah, that's insured. Most people do. <laughs> but what what is this whole control phenomenon? Do you still think that the non-custodial side of things is an absolute key element? Is it a trauma from Mount, Mount Gox that just got hacked and people just now they feel better that way or or what is this whole what does it mean when we say control our wealth or control our assets yeah. or own our What does that mean to you? <laughs> really good question. So what Bitcoin did was it changed something very fundamental in how people store and hold and transact value. It gave people the ability, although not the obligation, to hold and control their own assets for the first time ever. So you can create a private key and you can hold Bitcoin on that private key. No one else knows that that exists or that it's yours um, or where it's located. It is fully under your authority. And that's something really profound and powerful. That's the base layer of Bitcoin. Anyone can control and create private keys. Now, on top of that, people are building services for various types of convenience. Some of these services help you manage keys more safely and more easily. For example, Shapeshift has always been non-custodial. So when people are using Shapeshift, they're controlling their own keys still. There's other companies like Coinbase that take custody and control of your keys for you. That's also useful. That's also valuable. And um, I don't think Everyone should be in a self-custody model, and I certainly don't think everyone should be in a custodial model. The ability to move between those two models is what's really important. And each person can decide for themselves. They can store some on their own, some with a custodian. Maybe they start with a custodian and then learn how to be careful with it later. Or maybe the software gets good enough so that they don't need to worry about it being hard. Um, it, it's that flexibility. So I think throughout Bitcoin's future, uh, we're going to have both models. Both are valuable and people just need to understand what the trade-offs of each are. 
Wow, so elegant, Eric. You're so elegant, amazing. It's the way you craft these answers. Um, and this kind of leads me to what we were talking about a little bit earlier before I started the interview, which is kind of the evolution since you know 2011 when you kicked off in this space. There was a really interesting quote on intelligence saying, it's not Bitcoin that has changed over the last three years, but rather the world around it. Uh, how do you take this quote in, and have you seen a difference between you know the early days, the privacy activists, and the, the generation of today that's really interested in Bitcoin? Has there been a shift in generations or anything you noticed that's interesting? The phenomenon that you see is that the people that got involved really early tended to be like the cypherpunks, cryptographers, very radical libertarian types like myself. And they had really a profound ideological or technological interest in what this was. Um, those are, by definition, small niche groups. And for those of us who really do want Bitcoin to take over the world and become like the standard of account for money, that requires pulling in the rest of the world into that group. So what you've seen isn't that the nature of, of Bitcoin changes, it's that it is pulling in larger and larger concentric circles of, of user types. Um, you know, it's it's certainly been pulling in like the, the technically sophisticated computer programmers for a while, you know, uh, but it has not pulled in the rural farmer in India yet. Over time, it will pull in more and more and more people and eventually the entire world will be using it, but they'll all have different feelings about it. Many of them won't care about the technology. Many of them won't care about the, the ideology around it. And that's okay. It's useful for all these people. And so we should expect and embrace the fact that the demographics of the users are going to be changing and they always will change into the future until every last person is using this stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and I'm sure it resonates with all of the viewers out there. Guys, don't forget to reply in the live chat uh, and, and talk about this as well so we can get the debate going on. Uh, and this leads me to uh, another transition to another theme, um, Eric, which you had a really cool video on what Bitcoin did, which was Bitcoin versus altcoins, which was another very cool interview that you were featured in. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, all the other major blockchain protocols and companies that have been coming out. Obviously, there are multiple waves of generations of blockchains. But how do you see kind of the altcoins or the protocol tokens? Or are you interested in that space as well? And why? And if not, why not? It totally depends on the specific asset. There's this concept of Bitcoin versus altcoins. And some people are like just pro Bitcoin. And then some people are pro altcoins. And I think that's a really shallow way to look at it. Each asset from Bitcoin on has its own attributes, has its own history, its own goals, its own structure, um, its own dynamics. Each one deserves its own analysis. So there are a lot of altcoins, most, the vast majority that are absolute garbage. So I would never go around telling people, go invest in altcoins, right? That would be, that would be very silly. But within that whole group of thousands of different assets, there are some extremely profound projects, um, some of which rise to the level of Bitcoin itself, and they extend what Bitcoin is doing into other areas of crypto finance. Um, and I think they strengthen Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin makes them better and vice versa. So Ethereum obviously is one of these, you know, Ethereum's existence provides tools that Bitcoin cannot currently do, is not designed for, would be worse at doing. And the things that Ethereum has done, the design choices it has made, has made it worse than Bitcoin in certain ways. And so to understand the trade-offs of both of these things is really important. Um, people should be very careful about investing in any of these assets. They're all highly speculative. They're all highly volatile. Bitcoin is obviously the most conservative, uh, the most reliable, has the longest history. And unless you are really an expert on the space, um, I would never tell someone to own anything more than Bitcoin and Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I mean, just owning those two things is is great. Beyond that, there are absolutely great projects, but again, they deserve individual attention. Yeah, that makes so, so much sense. That's usually what I tell my friends and family when they call me up. What should I buy? What should I buy? I should just stick to Bitcoin for the time being if you want to put a small ratio on Ethereum. But those are the most trusted and most conservative, like you said, which is uh, really well yeah. put. But the one thing I would love to ask you, have we matured as a market like Eric, when I look at the top 100 by market cap in, let's say, 2015, and I look at the top 100 by market cap now in 2021, it looks like there are a lot, many, many quality projects now relative to 2015, 2016, 2017. Have we been maturing? Do you see higher quality projects coming out in the past year? Totally. 
Yeah. So, you know, on top of Bitcoin, there's all these, you know, DeFi projects. And again, a lot of them are garbage, but a lot of them are really, really cool. So now in the top 20, there are several of these new DeFi projects yeah. in there, like, like Aave, Maker, Uniswap. These are very legitimate projects. Um, and who knows what their proper valuation should be, but they are doing profoundly important things to, to create a much more robust and dynamic crypto finance ecosystem. So yeah, I, I I would used to look through like the top 20, the top 50 and kind of lament that there were maybe two or three that I would, you know, consider worth, worth owning, worth knowing about, worth using. Now there's 10 or 20 in the top 50. So definitely an improvement, but still, still a lot of nonsense. You know, <laughs> so people, should, people should be careful. People should be extremely careful. Please guys, do your own due diligence and make sure that you're, you're looking seriously into this, of course. And that sounds like the perfect tra transition to DEXs, right? And I think this is a topic that on top of Bitcoin that you, underst you understand extremely well, Eric. And um, uh, uh, you just mentioned Uniswap, right? Which uh, had incredible volumes last year. Actually, it had a day where it had more trading volume than Coinbase, which is kind of bonkers when you think about it. But uh, how is the DEX uh, ecosystem go uh, going along the these days, do you, do you see this as one of the most exciting topics of 2021? And please let us know your expert view. DEXs were the story of 2020. And uh, I didn't realize that until about halfway through 2020, but um, absolutely they, they are. So DEXs have been kind of, they've been possible, they've been theoretical, they've actually existed in various forms since like 2015, 2016. Uh, what has changed is that the, people used to be building DEXs that looked like uh, normal order book exchanges where you had bids and asks, but it was decentralized in some way. And the problem was that blockchains do not work very well for that model. And the latency there causes, um, causes them to be far too expensive. Um, the ability to make markets on an order book that is decentralized becomes very awkward. So these things worked, but they were not highly useful. They were not highly liquid. The real innovation that happened was is these these liquidity pools or um, these automated market maker mm -hmm. models, which are something totally different to an order book. Um, Uniswap is definitely not the first one to come up with this idea, but they're the ones that really caused it to just skyrocket. Mm -hmm. So in in Uniswap, basically people put pools of assets in. There are no order books. And because there are pools of assets versus order books, the latency of blockchains is much less important. And so you can now have highly liquid markets uh, on these on these DEXs. And um, yeah, it's it's incredible because what what Bitcoin has done is it pulled out money from from custodian from, from needing a custodian. Bitcoin brought that attribute to money itself. DEXs are bringing that attribute now one level higher to exchange itself. And some of the other DeFi projects are, are doing that for other parts of finance. So as the technology allows people to move from centralized custodians into a decentralized open source framework, um, that's really where you get the ability to have an entire global financial system move from banks and fiat into blockchains and cryptocurrency. Um, so I think it's a, a huge, a huge trend. People should absolutely be using this stuff. You know, like when I say Uniswap, I don't want people to go out there and buy the Uniswap token. I want them to go use Uniswap, go try that out, see how it works, compare that to a normal exchange, and you'll understand what, what's so cool about this. Definitely. And they, th they should try Shapeshift as well, obviously, you know, uh, a, a great DEX as well. And you guys are doing some innovative stuff, which is which is great. And speaking of which, you know, like in terms of shape, Shapeshift, but also just DEXs in, in general, uh, what is the destination for 2021? Like if you see the DEX as a Superman, what is the kryptonite? What do we need to achieve in order to to even further increase mass adoption and how, what is the ultimate goal do you think for the perfect decks i know it's a very difficult question i'm sorry to put you on the spot eric no, that's but good. would love to 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 see through your lens yeah so quick clarification um so shapeshift is not a dex but on uh, january 6th uh, just a few weeks ago we announced that we were integrating dexes into shapeshift so now when people are trading crypto they're trading with these dexes instead of with us so this is a, a profound change to our model and it lets us remove KYC and all the burdens of that that we've been suffering from for a couple of years. So we're not a DEX, but we've integrated things like Uniswap and others into our platform. Um, so the main limitation on DEXs right now is that they are Ethereum only. Hmm. And that means that they 
are built as smart contracts on the Ethereum chain, and they can only interact with Ethereum and ERC-20 tokens. Now that is you know, a majority of all the tokens out there, but it doesn't include the most important asset of all, Bitcoin. It doesn't include the other huge chains that are not on top of Ethereum. So that's the biggest limitation. Um, there are a couple projects that are working on cross-chain uh, liquidity pools, and that will actually bring the model of Uniswap across chains, and that will be really profound. So the main one that I've been following is ThorChain. Uh, that's not totally released yet, but it's fairly close. And that will allow someone to trade a native Bitcoin for a native Ethereum through a decentralized um, liquidity pool. That's going to be so cool and so exciting. That's never been done before. And it's really going to change the, change the game pretty profoundly. Um, also, Cosmos is building um, essentially a way of connecting disparate blockchains so that assets can move across them um, fairly fluidly. Um, and there will be automated market makers built into Cosmos that use those tokens. So as, a, as this goes from just an Ethereum phenomenon to a, a phenomenon across all major blockchains, um, we'll really see a profound change there. And, and the, the, the utility or the need for centralized exchange will become narrowed increasingly to just fiat to crypto. That will be their sole um, benefit and their sole value add. And that will be open, accessible to anyone, right? Is, is that kind of the ultimate goal, Eric, to have a non-vetted, completely open, fair, transparent uh, platform for people to, tr to trade or to exchange their assets? Yeah, these DEXs are open source, immutable, uh, and um, non-exclusionary. So they're borderless. Anyone from anywhere in the world can use them. Um, it, and that's, that's where the magic comes from. You, you remove the gates on, on this stuff. And just as it was important to have a internet ecosystem where people could communicate without gates and you didn't need a license to send an email, you don't need like some kind of counterparty to vet your messages that are going across the world. This video call that we're having right now, we can just set up no matter where we are in the world with no one's permission, right? That needs to exist in money. And Bitcoin has started that process. Ethereum is bringing that to other areas of finance. And eventually the end state is a totally open financial ecosystem that the entire world can use. That's the goal. Wow, oh, amazing, amazing. And since we're talking about 2021, are there any other things or even in the future, like, you know, I just wish I could just look through your eyes just a few moments, Eric, and, and really see what you're hoping to see, um, you know, in terms of developments this year, even possibly in the next year, or since you're, you're, you're a visionary, why not even tell us what's going to happen in five years, you know, like anything that you have that's interesting, or that you just hope would happen, uh, would be absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, what I hope would happen is what I hoped would happen in 2011 when I learned about Bitcoin, which is that Bitcoin becomes the main form of money in the world and that you get a decentralized financial system built on open immutable protocols. That's that's the goal. Now, that doesn't entirely happen in five years, but um, it should happen within 10 to 20 years. Right. So not not that long. We're in the process of it happening right now. But other than that macro view, um, it's super hard to make predictions in, in crypto, right? Like when Bitcoin came out, I had no ability to foresee Ethereum. And even when I started hearing about Ethereum, I did not understand it enough to really, to really get it until like a year after it had launched. So even for those of us who are in this industry and who pay attention to it every day, it is so loud and so noisy and things are moving in all different directions. It's very hard to predict anything. Um, I think one prediction for 2021 is, is just that this is going to be a, a bull year. This is going to be uh, one of the, the market rally cycles. Um, these are fun, exciting, scary, transformative. They bring in 10x the number of people that were in before. Mm. Uh, it will also lead to a horrible bear market crash again after the speculative bubble whenever that peaks. So people need to be ready for both. Um, and I think in terms of like products that are out there and, and features this year, I'm really excited to see more algorithmic stable coins. Mm. So, so I'm, I'm a big proponent of stable coins because they help people leave banks. They don't, you don't leave fiat, but you leave banks. Yeah. And that's a, an important stepping stone to get into native crypto. Um, so, you know, obviously USDC and, and Tether are these huge stable coins right now, but they have a custodian. And that's a huge risk and a huge problem. 
Um, something like Make or Die is a non-custodial, non-centralized stablecoin. Uh, there are other models getting built, so I'm excited to see those come out this year. And there's at least one called Haven, which is a like a private um, anonymous stablecoin that is algorithmically done. That seems super cool. Like to have a to have a coin with uh, with privacy features built in that is also stable. Um, I think that's a huge asset for the world, and so I I hope that uh, is released relatively soon. Um, but yeah, other than that, I try not to make too many predictions, you know, because <laughs> more than half the time they're they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, predictions are really really tough. Like every time I ask someone about the full year, they're like, I don't even know what's going to happen next week. So <laughs> how can you ask me for such yeah. a long timeline? Uh, but it, I think what you mentioned about uh, Ethereum, it, I, there's one last question I want to ask you rela related to that is, you know, obviously this transition to 2.0 is is a very big transition and technologically a very challenging transition. Do you still see Ethereum holding 90% of DeFi, or do you believe eventually, you know, just like any market, you know, other third gen blockchains, you know, like parachains and all the other guys who are coming up with new technology and, and actually come from the Ethereum background, et cetera, et cetera, could uh, take some of the, the space and it will be more balanced out eventually? Or do you still see Ethereum as the, 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 the beast, I guess, in this space? Yeah, well, certainly <laughs> the network effect for application development is 90% on Ethereum, if not more. But Ethereum has run into its scaling limits right now. The fees are atrocious. A lot of what people would like to do in DeFi does not make sense unless you're moving, you know, ten thousand, a hundred thousand dollars around. Uh, and everyone in Ethereum knows this, right? So it's not like a secret. Um, Ethereum's long-term roadmap is this uh, Ethereum 2.0 process, which is another one to three years. Uh, and its shorter-term solution is these these roll-ups, where you have essentially like you have sort of, um, they're sort of like side chains, but they basically give you a high throughput for certain applications um, on top of Ethereum without the base chain changing. Um, that is working okay, but is has its own trade-offs. So there is right now a huge opportunity for other higher throughput proof of stake chains to take some portion of the DeFi activity that's happening on Ethereum and moving it to other chains. Uh, it remains to be seen if any of them will be successful. I think Cosmos has a pretty good chance of doing this, uh, in large part because Cosmos's model is one in which it will connect to Ethereum, so people will be able to move between Ethereum and Cosmos zones very seamlessly. And you can kind of think of Cosmos as a layer two on top of Ethereum. It's not technically accurate, but it, it functionally it can work that way. So I think um, as these fees grow and as the demand for DeFi continues to increase, there will be some spillage into other ecosystems. Uh, and it remains to be seen like how, how widespread that gets. Um, but ult ultimately Ethereum can't stay put. Like no one, no one thinks it can survive with, with uh, $15 fees to do a, a transaction through a DEX. You know, like that's, it's an okay temporary situation, but long-term that'll get destroyed by a competitor if they don't solve it. <laughs> I was actually crying the other day, Eric, when I had to pay $62 for one of my transactions. I was like, no, yeah. please. <laughs> yeah, it's it's bad. And, and obviously this exists in Bitcoin too. The, the fees are high and will get higher during this rally year. But in Bitcoin, to the extent that you're only trying to move large amounts of money rarely, it still works great for that. But um, much of Ethereum's appeal is this DeFi stuff, which is largely targeted at smaller transactions that are at more high frequency. Those are completely obliterated by these high fees. I think you mentioned some really good points, guys. Just to summarize what Eric is saying. So we, we talked about Bitcoin uh, from 2011 when Eric fell in love with Bitcoin and the goal and the big picture and what is the definition of Bitcoin, which is very ambiguous and difficult. And we moved, of course, to stablecoin, DEXs. Uh, definitely, Eric, you know, not only I'm so happy to have you on the show, but also I would love to have you on the real production so you can come to the studio once this uh, pandemic is over. And in London, we have 4K and, and Netflix standard shoot. So we'd love to have you there. Let's and so Eric, obviously you're you're very active on Twitter. Is that the best place? So for all those watching out there, at Eric with a K, Vouris, V-O-O-R-H, double E-S. Are there any other platforms that you'd like people to follow you or anything to share with the community? No, Twitter's definitely the best. Um, you know, I'll, I'll shill Shapeshift. Go, go try out the new mobile app on Android and iOS. You can trade over DEXs there. Some really big things coming in the next couple months with that app as well. But Twitter's the place to find me. And uh, thanks for 
Thanks for having me on the show. It's always fun to talk about crypto. And by the way, Eric, that Pac-Man uh, GIF that you put is just so freaking good. <laughs> it's so it's so great. It just um, it just sits there, you know, like quietly gobbling up fiat. Um, so I think I'll leave it there for for years. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So thank you so much. And guys, if you like this show, don't forget to like, subscribe, blast the bell notification so you can get access to more of these timeless interviews. Today we had Eric Vouris, one of the legends in the space. We hope to see you every Wednesday premiering at a PC New Year, 8 o'clock GMT. Thank you so much and see you next week, guys. Yeah.